My name is Karl Schaller. I am a neurosurgeon in Geneva, and I participated in the group uh, which, um, in fact, developed this um, or had this project together with industry and us, the clinicians, in order to advance with interpretive resection mapping at the same time. As I must say, the new way how to map during resection of brain tumors, notably of intrinsic tumors such as glioma, has really led to a paradigm change. For me, it has been a real game changer how I operate gliomas. Also, how I prepare the cases beforehand. And um, as you will see, um, how surgery is being guided uh, with this new and with this novel technology or tool. Uh, my talk will be divided in three major parts an introduction, my general view on um, neurosurgery, recent developments, on integration of technology. Then I will talk specifically about monitoring and mapping and about the application of this new device. And then uh, there will be four or five slides on ongoing research before I will arrive at the conclusion. I would encourage you, because I don't see it, it's, it might be a bit boring uh, so for you just to listen and have very little interaction. Um, if you have a question, please interrupt uh, me or sort of signal that to the Suring team so that, uh, that your question will pop up immediately in some corner here on my screen. For the time being, I can't see any questions or any any uh, comment box, but you may signal this to the Suring team, and then I will, of course, interrupt and immediately refer to your question. It might be a bit more fun. So how about monitoring and resection mapping in neurosurgery? And why is this so different from how I used to work before? So first of all, I would like to share this. In fact, this is a slide I did many years ago uh, while I was still trained in epilepsy surgery in Bonn. And uh, this shows a bit the general concept of uh, brain surgery. Uh, frequently, we are confronted with a circumscript or infiltrative lesion uh, in any area of the brain, which may, if it's epileptogenic, may be surrounded by an epileptogenic zone. Or if we are talking about a glioma, which may have an overlap also with functionally relevant zones. So on the one hand, we would like to control the disease, so we have to be as radical as possible. On the other hand, of course, we need to preserve function in order to do as little damage as possible to our patients. Hmm. And this, of course, requires um, you know, safety measures before and especially during surgery. And this is where monitoring and mapping, of course, comes into play. Hmm. Uh, when I arrived in Geneva now, about now well over 15 years ago, there has been no um, team dedicated to interpretive mapping and uh, monitoring. So this was something we started from scratch here. And as opposed to other centers um, where there was already internally interested um, neurosurgeons and neurologists. In fact, I had to start out with engineers from the engineering school, uh, EPFL, and also our local engineering school. And then later on, there were uh, more neuroscientists, neuroscience-oriented people who joined the team. So the approach is a bit different. However, um, it uh, has really flourished and um, came to fruitful collaboration uh, between the engineers of our team and the engineers of interested industrial partners, which, of course, uh, I will show you later what uh, has led to the current um, application of resection mapping in neurosurgery. So um, when reflecting on glioma surgery, then the glioma surgery in uh, up to now, in December 21, January 2022, um, in the past, what I would call neurosurgery 1.0, uh, when monolithic monumental pioneer neurosurgeons decided everything. They opened their head, they did the clinical assessment of the patient, and they played, of course, the most eminent uh, role in the whole uh, setting. Anesthesiologists uh, were, would hardly exist, of course, they would follow the order by the surgeon. The Yashagel generation, pioneer neurosurgeons, um, of course, they were still eminent figures, 
However, they accepted a bit more the anesthesiologist already as a partner. And of course, the technical development is of importance for our, um, for our uh, complex field of surgery. And industry, of course, uh, gradually um, came in to the play. And this is what I think uh, might be displayed as neurosurgery as of today. 3.0, where we are, of course, a leading partner of Primus Inter Paris. However, there is a number of partners when it comes to the surgery of gliomas and the adequate treatment of our patients. This doesn't only require a surgical action, it requires a full partnership in anesthesiology, oncology, psychology, a full network approach. This is different from the past. And this is where we are heading it um, in our, yeah, in our responsibility uh, for the patient. So, and there is a number of pre-surgical and interpretive and post-operative actions. It starts, of course, preventive planning is essential. We include all kinds of imaging and functional evaluation of the patient's psychology whatsoever. And um, of course, interpretive um, aid is being either depending on the setting where you're working at. Of course, we all work with a microscope or with an exoscope. Um, however, some centers may already have access to interpretive MRI, other kinds of imaging, interpretive fluorescence, and of course, a vague anatomy might be an option. Out of course, monitoring and mapping. This is what we are centering around today. Um, connectivity is key. Um, so the upper left corner, you see already uh, the resection device, what we are talking about today. But so far, all these tools like this one or the microscope or the monitoring device or even our the way how we navigate and manipulate the images, all these are kind of standalone solutions in an ever complex environment, which is our OR. And this is where we are, in fact, we should, we should rule. And it's our responsibility to, to make sure that all data are uh, present in order to uh, safely operate our patients. But all these things need to be connected in a meaningful way to make our work more intuitive and of course, very safe. And I show you how it's uh, happening in our department and with the new resection mapping device and can assure you that in the future, even the head clamp will be an integral part of all this, um, this, this, this pilot system where everything will be connected, data will be available and all these tools shall communicate in a, in a useful manner. So the preemptive setup for planning, you're all aware of this, you may do it uh, in front of a screen or you may use this uh, fancy mixed reality goggles, it doesn't matter, of course, uh, but you, you need, uh, given the enormous amount of preemptive images which are being acquired, be them functional or structural or whatsoever, you need tools to help you to focus on the essential, which means you have to define the lesion and find what is important around and then virtually move the patient in the ideal position to plan your approach and take out the lesion. Intraoperatively, you may use um, a combination of the microscope and your navigation tool. And in order to um, develop mixed reality approaches, and I'm saying really mixed reality because um, which will allow you a super imprecision of the images on the patient on the patient's head to plan your anatomy and how to, which allows you already to position the patient in an adequate way. But also during surgery, uh, where you may constantly recalibrate the accuracy of your image. And mixed reality is important because it allows you to interact and to have a real overlay on real anatomy and how to introduce tools which you may mark in order to um, uh, in order to have them, um, in order to have them being part of this setting, uh, there was just a question, but I haven't. Now it disappeared. I don't know. Uh, there was a question about uh, vestibular schwannoma. Uh, this was yeah. all I saw. Um, vestibular schwannomas we also use with this device. Uh, we operate with this device with a section mapping device. We are not there yet, but of course, um, uh, it is very helpful when you're inside with a, with a slow with a uh, you're gentle with your resection device, be the 
call this the Suri device or another ultrasonic aspirator. And you may always follow uh, and use this as a, as a mapping device um, along the fascial nerve, for example. And if you combine it with mixed reality, where you may even uh, have a visualization of uh, other nerves or the internal meters, uh, this is extremely helpful. So this works for vestibular schwannomas as well and for other kinds of tumors, you'll see. Um, then um, the mixed reality, in fact, this has been evaluated by uh, Julie Hamelie from my group and Philippe Glenga. We have clear evidence now, scientific evidence in independent study groups that it is not only faster to use, but it's very intu and intuitive, but it's uh, even a little bit more precise than conventional pointer-based navigation. So as part of this resection program with the new resection device, um, the application or simultaneous application of mixed reality or augmented reality is adding another level of security. Um, so preoperative imaging, of course, this is, uh, this is basic knowledge. You try to integrate whatever is it posi it's positable, for example, for low-grade glioma uh, in the dominant temporal lobe. Of course, you do functional MRI. You may do functional mapping before in order to understand where is the language network, which may be very complex. You may apply DTI or DSI tractography, which shall be part of the pre-surgical planning, because this has an impact on your resection plan. And during resection, you have to orient yourself on images, but also on electrophysiology. <laughs> and TMS has become a new standard, especially when it comes to the relation of large and complex networks, such as the network of language. And here, of course, a group in Berlin around Peter Weikotzi, Thomas Picht, and Munich uh, with Sandro Krieg and Bernhard Meyer have been bridges and um, leading the path. And now, of course, it's of widespread use. And to integrate these results in your resection plan are extremely helpful uh, for access planning and also, of course, for your resection and for your, your preparation um, when it comes to the use of interpretive brain mapping and white matter um, tract mapping. Mm, our interview setup allows us to use interpretive MRI. So if you are very cautious or anxious with our uh, resection, we may stop at a certain point in time, then do a new MRI and integrate these new data, structural data, or also functional data, such as derived from arterial spin lading or fiber tracking into the now new adapted resection plan doing surgery. But of course, this, this adds another 45 minutes uh, of uh, interrupted surgery. Mm. Modern microscopes allow, of course, um, due to their robotic or exoscopic um, um, properties and qualities, uh, allow to look at all angles, at pre plan angles, but also they allow, of course, to uh, integrate in a 3D way an overlay of mixed reality pictures. And this is, this is of course, very colorful, but it's also just to show uh, what is possible. Each surgeon has his own or her own preferences. Doesn't have to be super blue, but some people like uh, five or 10 or 20 different objects in the microscope. I don't like that. I always try to focus on the essential, but the lesion and the corticospinal tract, for example, this in my opinion is very important if it's accurate. And new augmented reality tools during surgery allow you to almost in real time readjust uh, to the anatomy, even during your section. And this together, with mapping, of course, is uh, creating a lot more safety than it used to um, be the case in the past with all, all these tools. So even image integration of all kinds is possible in the microscope. Of course, here it's 2D only, but in reality, it's 3D. You may have a look on in the mic matter. You don't really know where you are because it's a low grade tumor whatsoever, but you may uh, confirm your anatomical um, allocation and then, of course, integrate uh, the resection plan into your oculars in a 3D manner. This applies to all kinds of bone work, of course, is particular uh, facilitated in particular with the application of mixed reality. Here, for example, the, the uh, standard being the optic nerve. Of course, when you always have a visual control already of the anatomy, this is extremely helpful. And this is, of course, uh, has been a big step 
forward um, for uh, interoperative security. In gliomas, of course, coming back to gliomas, we know that it is important in malignant gliomas to resect as much as possible. Only if we arrive at a full resection of um, the uh, contrast enhancing power of the glioma will we achieve a significant prolongation of survival. And uh, of course, this has to be balanced against the functional outcomes. And this is then, of course, where uh, mapping and monitoring comes into play. And uh, there's an, um, also by the group from UCSF together with U24 over the leaders in interpretive mapping and monitoring uh, who have clearly shown in a meta-analysis that patients benefit from the use of interpretive monitoring in the sense that if you use monitoring to maximize your resection in a more or less safe way, then you achieve longer survival and better quality of life. So this is a traditional way. Normally, if you stimulate the, the white matter tract, you use bipolar stimulation, and you all are familiar with these kind of stimulators. This is a traditional way how it works. So you, you operate, you, you, you look at your pathology, and then, of course, it might be the low-grade glioma. It might be almost impossible to distinguish between the tumor tissue and healthy tissue. And of course, the uh, corticospinal tract is blue only on DTI images. It's not blue in the patient's brain. Hmm. So this is when uh, you enhance uh, interpretive safety by the application of uh, bipolar stimulation. Of course, you want to follow the tract. You want to find the tract and approach the tract with your resection without, of course, passing through or uh, creating, creating damage. Hmm. But of course, this requires frequent fitting around, you look to the table of the nurse, and you, 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 uh, you drop your resection device, the ultrasonic aspirator, then you use a bipolar stimulator, then you have to remember where you put it, then you, you go back and forth. So this is, uh, of course, has proved to be useful for many years, but of course, it is not a very uh, straightforward and uh, intuitive way to work. So we would like to improve this workflow and still have better control of our resection. This is why in, <laughs> this is an image of 2010, <laughs> how we decided to try um, to stimulate the resection device. And this is, uh, was an old OR and looked like uh, uh, this big uh, clamp on top. And we use monopolar stimulation with this kind of uh, model, of, uh, of course, as we do also today. But of course, it was very clumsy. There has to be proof of concept. There has to be CE marked. You all know it takes years and years because it's so complicated to uh, finally arrive at this solution, which exists now, where you just put a clip and um, you're allowed, you're allowed, officially allowed to use it in uh, brain tumor surgery. It was a long way there, but the goal, of course, is to minimize the risk of neurological damage. You're all familiar with the motor mapping. And here's already, uh, you see this ultrasonic aspirator connected and there's a tumor. You see the corticospinal tract. And by the application of um, continuous stimulation, you have a direct feedback of what's happening. Either you have a, an image or a red or a green light in your microscope, or you have a monitoring team, or you have audio visual control of what's happening, or someone is warning you, hey, uh, Surgeon, you're arriving, I stimulate at 10 milliampere. There's a big response. And this is how you're uh, sort of approaching the, uh, the, um, the capsule of the tumor or the uh, infiltrated zone, which may have a very close relationship with the, um, with the corticospinal tract in this case here. So the cavitational ultrasonic aspirator is functioning as a stimulating probe itself. And then, of course, you don't need all this fiddling around with, okay, I give you the stimulator, who are, where are we? You have, don't have to memorize where you are by reinserting a new instrument. You may just continue your work. All your change is, of course, the stimulation parameters from whatever 10 milliampere, you go down to five, four, three, whatever. And then you have a direct response, of course, uh, of what's happening. Um, ideally, and these are early photos uh, during the during the test trials. Um, we would be able to have um, direct communication because in the OR it can be noisy. 
then it would also be nice to have this injected in the microscope. This is something we are working on and also other teams to have, so to say, a direct uh, control as a surgeon uh, of what is happening. Um, and um, this may, for example, here uh, may, may appear if I'm too close to the corticospinal tract, there may be a red light, like in the traffic light, telling me, hey, stop, uh, don't go any further. So uh, <laughs> this uh, looks a bit like a very improvised, but this was a basic device which we used to, um, to implement for, uh, for uh, direct feedback stimulation. So the ideal would be for us, in fact, to uh, set a threshold um, of let's say five milliampere, this and this amount of amplitude reduction, and then the resection device should stop by itself. So this is uh, something which is under development, um, but it shows you what it takes to establish also such a relationship with your industrial partner and your research partners, what needs to be done uh, in order to advance, although it's only one part of the big cake of innovative safety. So, because this applies to all other tools as well, the microscope, the navigation, the headclamp, bot server, and each of us, we are functioning like a whole team or a swarm intelligence. So we focus more on this kind of uh, improvement of the tool, others come up with something else. And in the end, you will see uh, all these tools will be connected in a meaningful manner and making surgery safer. Now I would like to show some examples and pictures so um, this we'll see again in a small video. Here you see the corticospinal tract, you see the optic radiations, the stimulation tool. Uh, the tool may not only be used as said for gliomas, but also vestibular schwannomas and uh, for optic pathway tumors in epilepsy for all kinds of surgery. And you may know, for example, this is um, my, in fact, my best friends and also competitor, of course, Andreas Rabe. You may be familiar with this. Uh, one may sucker device, which may be connected and may be used as a, a stimulation device. We started about at the same time with our ideas. I wanted to have my resection tool. I found it more logical to use a resection tool as a mapping tool. And but he introduced the, the sucker, and I think these are very complementary tools. But the goal is always to be in the, the focus of your work, where you really see what you're doing also to have the physiological feedback from, um, from, your, um, from your stimulation. I see there's a question. Um, integration with bone coups are possible? Uh, yes, possible. A vestibular schwannoma, I told you, yes, very helpful. I always use it. Um, is it complex? Another question from uh, Holger. Uh, he is asking, is it complex to set up the combination of ultrasonic aspirate and mapping device? No, it's not difficult. You will see it in, in a minute, I'll show you. And um, Sempaoti, any grounding ultrasonic aspirates? Um, this is a more engineering physical question. Of course, we had to work uh, on a lot of issues related to, um, to, to um, of, of electrostatic issues. But these have been resolved in a, in a normal. It's really not a big deal anymore. Um, and but now these issues have been resolved, um, like grounding and whatsoever. So I hope I answered these questions. And now we, we go on. Um, this is how it looks. See, this is a nurse. Ducks, one click. Now the device is connected. You see the, the table here. And I'm sitting here. And then, of course, surgery may, uh, may continue. I can show you one more time, so in one second. You just click it on the handpiece and it's done. So very easy. Um, this is uh, just to show you various ways how to use it. Um, you see the corticospinal tract, the lesion, and then you may have audio visual feedback. For example, you will hear in a second, depending on what monitoring device you use. Um, see here we have the you have the foot, here is the hand, and you may have a feedback 
immediate feedback from the use of this device. This is a, another example, which includes, as you can see here, the mixed reality um, display of the corticospinal tract. And you may, uh, may then see what's happening at the uh, level of the potentials. This is another example. I move a bit forward, but you have good audio. I don't know, no, I put here. C8, S2, C7. So you immediately get a feedback even uh, for the muton, C7, C8, L2, whatever. Yeah? L4. C8. So you, you know exactly where you are. You know what's the stimulation uh, strength, amplitude. S2. And then S2. you hear if you're close to the face, close to the arm, S2. or close L4. to the leg. S2. Uh, when you're operating on, for example, insular cleomas and you approach the, of course, the, the, um, the knee of the internal capsule at some distance, but everything looks deformed, then you may use this tool in an ideal manner to gradually approach uh, the hot zone. You may combine it with, um, um, with fluorescence. For example, some people uh, like to do surgery uh, under blue light because then they have the maximum uh, visualization of the chromophores. And of course, then you use your stimulator or suction mapping device. And at the same time, you will then get a feedback um, from your electrophysiology team, maybe again, acoustic feedback or, or visual alone, but the here, see you have a forearm, you have the hand and you have the biceps, you, you immediately get feedback and you see exactly what you're doing, where you are. So this is, in my opinion, something really interesting uh, to use. Here is a combination you see of stimulation. And here you see the cortical spinal tract again. This used to be, this was a lesion. And of course we are trying, here we are very close to the cortical spinal tract. Here you have the left foot, tibia left, vastus lateralis left, and here the left arm. And of course, if you're coming too close to the cortical spinal tract, you would have the alarm uh, running. So and this is in my opinion, a very, very helpful tool to have direct visual control and electrophysiological control of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, this is just, um, uh, this was when during interoperative imaging was used, we were a bit afraid going back further, but you use all the integration of this imaging together with um, such kind of a resective a resection and mapping device. This has been validated and published uh, not long ago. The proof of concept has been published. Now we have the first patient series for motor uh, was published. The rule of thumb, which is of course very tempting, that one millimeter ampere translates in one millimeter distance. It was not entirely true for our series. Here you see our idealized, uh, our, our um, uh, extrapolation. We had um, uh, one patient were at um, where it was really disproportionate, um, the discrepancy between stimulation and distance from the, um, from the um, corticospinal tract. Um, so it cannot be entirely trusted. You have to apply your own surgical experience and reasoning in order to safely resect when you're approaching um, the corticospinal tract, for example, or the visual tract. In the end, uh, you have to trust yourself and the method, once you're used to it, uh, when you combine what you see, what you have as visualization information at hand from navigation and as well uh, as a physiological feedback through the stimulator yeah. device. Um, this was this publication and this was a case I've already shown to you, but because we also applied, of course, for the visual pathway and for other uh, pathways and the vestibular schwannomas, of course, it's equally possible. Um, now the last part, but only four or five slides, all this to show you that um, all this requires, of course, an environment which uh, fosters and promotes 
uh, applied research. Um, uh, of course, most new research will never uh, win the Nobel Prize, but what we can do, we can gradually uh, improve our working environment and the safety of surgery, uh, which is of course important for our patients. So on the one hand, we are um, teaming up with, for example, um, the Suring team for the ultrasonic resection mapping. But of course, on the other hand, we also need uh, better electrodes because with brain shift, the traditional electrodes, they move around. They are not really um, um, smooth to, to apply. Um, so we have a whole uh, electrode um, uh, development team at the School of Engineering. And we have tested the bundles of these new developments and new electrodes will soon be out, which will be very flexible, very thin, uh, stretchable, and can be applied even into very small and remote places. And uh, more recently, of course, not only talking about motor evoked potentials, but we're also interested to use this uh, stimulation uh, section mapping device uh, for the measurement of human heartbeat of the potentials. This is a study which is underway because uh, we have evidence that human heartbeat evoked potentials may serve as a biomarker for human consciousness. And this is something where we as surgeons, of course, are working frequently in and around such areas for multisensory integration. And of course, to have a resection device, which also allows to map such kind of potentials would be very helpful. So this is uh, maybe the next step to also not only map uh, fascial nerve function, vestibular schwannoma surgery or motor tract function, whatsoever, but also other um, potentials which may be uh, of importance for our functioning as human beings as a whole. But this is, of course, research. And now let me conclude. I, um, for myself and uh, people around me, <laughs> um, this kind of mixed reality assisted resection stimulation uh, technique and technology, it represents a very natural step forward to increase not only my, uh, my comfort, of course, because I don't have to always change instruments, stimulate in out, ask someone who is doing what did you see where we stimulate it. So this is a very, very um, intuitive way to do surgery, in my opinion. Uh, surgery safety improves. There has been uh, it could be shown that mixed reality alone uh, allows to um, increase the sort of the margin to to improve the margin of error as compared to standard pointer based stimulation and of course with immediate combination of visual and physiological feedback uh, surgery it becomes a lot more natural in my opinion and um, it is also helpful to use of course mixed reality because it allows you to interact with the patient anatomy, with the tools, and with the pre-surgical information, which of course uh, has to be integrated and um, be part of your uh, surgical setup to be available and accessible during surgery. As otherwise, it doesn't make sense to have 100,000 of images if you cannot access them in real time during surgery. Of course, it's important. You saw how important it is. If you want to map something, you need the uh, white matter tracks at high resolution and the combination of um, navigated TMS uh, said and of uh, either diffusion sensor or tensor imaging is very important. For me, this has led to a really a game change in glioma surgery, notably uh, this combination of imaging, mixed reality and resection mapping. And I think this is exemplary for uh, our um, yeah, also for our duty to advance technologically and it shows how it is possible also it takes years of course and a lot of patients um, on the way to what um, at least I am thinking of the full connectivity of my surgical environment and of all these devices and tools which we are using. That is the end of the talk. I thank you. Should you still be there for your attention? I'm thankful and grateful for the team who has participated in all that and the studies and development, uh, notably Colette Brex, uh, who is my sort of the head engineer, and all these other, of course. And um, uh, well, open for any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your great presentation. Uh, I have seen in our question and answer channel that we have, uh, yeah, three questions open. Uh, Vika, 
is corresponding to your to the note question. Uh, I agree with you regarding the resection tool to be connected with mapping. Then the suction, the suction to a secondary device for glioma surgery. So I think it's it's a statement. <laughs> yeah, it's there. I see it's there now. I see it. Yeah. Because it's seventeen twenty nine minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, I. Fight I spoke, of course, a lot with Andreas Rabe. It's, it's, it depends on the surgeon. So I found it, of course, more logical as many others. I'm a right-handed surgeon. I, the resection device to be connected as a mapper, I found it ideal. For others, um, they like more the, the Rabe suction device. Doesn't matter. But what is good also from your side is that you're providing the option uh, to let people select. <laughs> so then the next question was at 5.30 from Jacques Nel. Can you apply the same principle of one millimeter? Um, there's no clear scientific answer. In fact, I'm, I'm following this rule of thumb, although there's no clear scientific evidence, but I'm using it in the same way. The tissue, uh, as you know, is it's very similar to, to brain tissue. Uh, and um, it helps me a lot. Um, it's not so, important to, to go down to one millimeter. But what I like is that I started say six, seven milliampere, and then I know already, oh, where's the nerve? Is it in the upper right corner or is it in the left, left corner? It helps me to orient myself in the, in the beginning um, and also then in the very end again, uh, when the tumor is being thinned out and then I can trust my eyes in combination with the electrophysiological response. Because again, asking a lot, uh, or now uh, in a conflict, would you trust the mixed strategy with the finger or the CUSA based? Uh, I would always trust more my eyes and the electrophysiology rather than um, uh, a mixed reality, sort of an, an overlay of an image. Because the overlay of the image, I would of course have to uh, realign and to recalibrate uh, before I will really trust. But the physiology, in my opinion, beats the, uh, the simple overlay of images. However, together, they are quite good. <laughs> because, and there's Steve, there's a Reshav Prasad Saha, uh, 542. Good evening. How accurate is this when compared to standalone navigation system? Uh, as said, um, when you're using mixed reality, it is now more accurate than a standard point of based navigation system, especially when you apply the new interpretive correction tools. It is called the, um, the signature vessels, for example, during surgery, you uh, recalibrate the brain deformation based on visible anatomy. You can recalibrate um, certain bifurcation of vessels, which of course deform in 3D space during the resection of a big tumor. And then you have recalibrated the whole thing. And um, then you're sort of more or less safe again. You may reorient yourself and have, uh, of course, a better accuracy than if you would rely on uh, only navigation. But as said, the maximum, in my opinion, is to have the combination of both visual accuracy, recalibration during surgery, of the fiber tracks, of the anatomy, together with the electrophysiological feedback from mapping. I think these were all great. That is a thank you, Prof, very nice. Steve, greetings to Steve, very friendly guy. So, great, are there any more questions? Juliana Castaneda. Nos vemos, gracias. Famous name, Castaneda, con Carlos. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, um, yeah. Maybe if there are in, I don't know, in one hour or in a half hour, a question that comes to your mind, 
Um, please feel free to ask us by, um, via the, the LinkedIn QR code that you can see on the slide. And just let us know by the comments maybe, or contact us directly. Then we will, um, yeah, we will share the question with uh, Professor Shala. Oh, there is there is a question. <laughs> yeah, is there any interaction between ultrasonic uh, with electric impulses? This is um, uh, this is a question which was raised in the very beginning and. Um, uh, as a doctor, I was, of course, not able to, to solve all that. But um, um, Colette Boyx, I mentioned her, she has a PhD in engineering, and we have a bunch of engineers, and all these things uh, have been ruled out. Uh, sometimes, of course, as you may know, there may be an issue with mapping and monitoring in surgery. Um, we had an issue with one particular microscope, which disturbed um, sort of the mapping. So you need you need to know your room, you need to know your instruments and your, your sort of your monitoring team so as to make sure there is no disturbance. But the ultrasonic itself um, does not have a negative impact on the, uh, on the electric impulses. And this was ruled out. We've done lab studies, uh, we've done cadaver studies, a lot of things. Uh, so this should be, um, there should be a safe and good interaction between uh, all these um, electrical and waves of sound. And um, I hope this answers your question, but I'm not an engineer, sorry. But if not, um, um, maybe uh, we, I see that uh, Colette Bogues is also with us uh, and I can give her permission to speak. Oh, of course, yeah, let Colette uh, answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, I think Jose Carlos Ortiz Jimenez. Hello. <laughs> Colette. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, so um, we did the uh, testing before, and uh, also what we do is that we use a system that are that have a current source, and uh, using current sources, you uh, you guarantee that you have the, the current you need, and uh, there is no interaction between the different system. The, cu the current will go only on the uh, electrophysiology uh, system and through the patient. I don't know if you if that respond to, to the question. Well, we maybe we will never know, but at least you gave a, a precise answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, uh, Mrs. Brooks, you are also now a discussion. Um, um yeah in our discussion so if there are further questions to to miss books or oh, please feel free also to ask um yeah are there more questions if not yeah um at least maybe i also can show you on the smart small camera our device which is now compatible to the innomate stimulation clip yeah, like uh, Professor Shala always, uh, you just have shown it's pretty easy to connect and that's all. So if you have some question also about the device, please feel free to ask us. So then, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Professor Shala for the presentation and your time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank everyone for listening who stayed and hope to see you sometime. Also, welcome in Geneva. Mm -hmm.